Hello and welcome again to this series of webinars where we're talking about uh, multilinguals, uh, bilinguals, multiculturalism. Today's episode, we're going to go in a bit deeper because we're going to try to understand all the digital changes that have been affecting us, uh, that we've been forced to go through with the pandemic, how that can affect uh, multi channeling and how that can affect people uh, retaining the ability to, 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 to learn these languages. However, I would like to start with one element. Uh, I would like to play uh, a short video, which will actually fall into the grand scheme of things that we've already talked about, but we'll try to explain more in depth of how bilingual brains, which are capable of switching between codes, not only gives the people the ability to for further their abilities in life, but the way that it also allows them to be much more creative and within the confines of the technological world, which we are now upon, uh, it'll show you a practical approach into how many of these elements could uh, fall into place and actually, again, move these people uh, forward. After that, uh, we'll have, of course, a, a, a presentation and I'll go into detail of all the very things uh, that we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about things such as 21st century skills, project-based learning, uh, localization, artificial neural networks, AI, C, uh, MS, and LMS. And then uh, I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that have been sent to me over the last period or over the last month. Uh, concerning how to go forward, how to continue with the traditional model of education and go into the online form. So in other words, how do we play with languages, but how do we play with them using online tools and technology? But first off, as promised, I would like to play this short video about how, why multilinguals are equally important in the entire whole thing. So the benefits of a bilingual brain, please enjoy. Hablas espanol? Parlez-vous français? Ni hui shou zhong wen ma? If you answered si, oui, or hui, and you're watching this in English, chances are you belong to the world's bilingual and multilingual majority. And besides having an easier time traveling or watching movies without subtitles, knowing two or more languages means that your brain may actually look and work differently than those of your monolingual friends. So what does it really mean to know a language? Language ability is typically measured in two active parts, speaking and writing, and two passive parts, listening and reading. While a balanced bilingual has near equal abilities across the board in two languages, most bilinguals around the world know and use their languages in varying proportions. And depending on their situation and how they acquired each language, they can be classified into three general types. For example, let's take Gabriela, whose family immigrates to the U.S. from Peru when she's two years old. As a compound bilingual, Gabriella develops two linguistic codes simultaneously with a single set of concepts, learning both English and Spanish as she begins to process the world around her. Her teenage brother, on the other hand, might be a coordinate bilingual, working with two sets of concepts, learning English in school while continuing to speak Spanish at home and with friends. Finally, Gabriella's parents are likely to be subordinate bilinguals, who learn a secondary language by filtering it through their primary language. Because all types of bilingual people can become fully proficient in a language regardless of accent or pronunciation, the difference may not be apparent to a casual observer. But recent advances in brain imaging technology have given neurolinguists a glimpse into how specific aspects of language learning affect the bilingual brain. It's well known that the brain's left hemisphere is more dominant in analytical and logical processes while the right hemisphere is more active in emotional and social ones, though this is a matter of degree, not an absolute split. The fact that language involves both types of functions while lateralization develops gradually with age has led to the critical period hypothesis. According to this theory, 
children learn languages more easily because the plasticity of their developing brains lets them use both hemispheres in language acquisition. While in most adults, language is lateralized to one hemisphere, usually the left. If this is true, learning a language in childhood may give you a more holistic grasp of its social and emotional contexts. Conversely, recent research showed that people who learned a second language in adulthood exhibit less emotional bias and a more rational approach when confronting problems in the second language than in their native one. But regardless of when you acquire additional languages, being multilingual gives your brain some remarkable advantages. Some of these are even visible, such as higher density of the gray matter that contains most of your brain's neurons and synapses, and more activity in certain regions when engaging a second language. The heightened workout a bilingual brain receives throughout its life can also help delay the onset of diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia by as much as five years. The idea of major cognitive benefits to bilingualism may seem intuitive now, but it would have surprised earlier experts. Before the 1960s, bilingualism was considered a handicap that slowed a child's development by forcing them to spend too much energy distinguishing between languages, a view based largely on flawed studies. And while a more recent study did show that reaction times and errors increase for some bilingual students in cross-language tests, it also showed that the effort and attention needed to switch between languages triggered more activity in and potentially strengthened the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain that plays a large role in executive function, problem solving, switching between tasks, and focusing while filtering out irrelevant information. So while bilingualism may not necessarily make you smarter, it does make your brain more healthy, complex, and actively engaged. And even if you didn't have the good fortune of learning a second language as a child, it's never too late to do yourself a favor and make the linguistic leap from hello to hola, bonjour, or ni hao's. Because when it comes to our brains, a little exercise can go a long way. And I would like to thank our TED-Ed team for preparing the video. Uh, I hope that uh, this cleared many of the things that I was talking about in previous uh, sessions, uh, more, more up to you, uh, showing that this does have a unique perception on reality, but it also gives the child and the person who later goes in life through being a bilingual or a multilingual, this uh, ability to process things on a platform in which both left and right hemisphere brain functions allow us to go beyond, let's say, regular thinking. So I use this especially as an introduction because what we want to focus in today's meeting is we want to focus on technology and how to use that technology and how technology actually is now the current link that, that will support your multilingual, your multicultural growth. So well, I have prepared a presentation, so I will share my first slide uh, with you guys. It's, welcome to the 21st century, right? From a translator's point of view, because what I also do is I translate. So I am somebody who is in a profession of not only teaching English as a foreign language, as a language instructor and language coach, but I also use my bilingual skills in the translation field, right? And I can tell you that my field has changed ever so much because of technology compared to what it was years ago. But the whole idea behind thinking from the point of view of zero, one, and one, zero, which is the basis for our internet, is actually the understanding that mathematics, technology is nothing more than a language. So if we start thinking about technology in terms of linguistics and the elements that go inside your brain where everything is, is, is taking place, then basically it's easier for us to, to get a grasp on this. So the days in my business, when classic text editors such as Word were used in the translation process, they are gone. 
nobody is ever going to uh, allow you or, or give you the time to work on a text uh, for days and days ahead. Think of it, think it over, go one way, go the other, and go oh, and, and it's sleep. No. And technology changed that because right now, as you can see, files received from customers may have different formats. Currently, clients provide the whole web content as well as collections of text chains which are extracted from software source code. And global communication systems are increasing translation output and basically they're ensuring quality. In other words, what technology do is doing to help me in my field as a translator is my inner understanding or my inner conviction that something is done correctly or is represented correctly in a common language, right? I frequently use ANN technology, which is artificial neuron technology, in order to help me with that. But in order to understand this completely, we need to get to know what I call the know-how, right? And in using technology in language teaching, in translation, or in any other form of language-based work or linguistic-based work, we have to look at four basic elements. First of all, the tools that are accessible to us. Tools can come in a lot in lots of forms. They come in the form of both hardware and software, various applications, but also intuitive thinking in how the algorithmic structure is done in order to achieve success at the end. Now, algorithms are nothing more than simply zero, one, yes, no, plus, minus. So if this happens, then this. If this happens, then this doesn't happen. And it's a way of going through an entire system. Now, over the years, we have developed something which we call AI, which is artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is now helping us with, um, with a lot of things, and I'll show you how that helps in various circumstances, also in terms of language teaching or, or, or language uh, or translation or any other things that you might be interested in. The use of CMSs, which are the content management systems, which were then the base for the creation of something which we call the learning management system, which is the LMS. So many prominent uh, features of such um, technologies, such as Blackboard, which is used for online teaching, uh, is based on the whole CMS content. But technology goes beyond that. Technology also allows people with disabilities to finally find their way into society and to become successful. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard about a guy called Christopher Hills. You probably haven't. You might put it on Google, you might try to find something, but this is an extraordinary person who has done a remarkable leap in his life thanks to technology. So as a second inspirational video, I would also like to share this one so that everybody can feel inspired. Hi, I'm Lucifer. I was born with I can't.
Boah. Oh, ihr zwei Heilen. Oh, ihr Augen auf wieder. Oh, Alter. Oh, ihr mal Augen bitte. Ich hätte wohl ich hätte nur Quite powerful stuff there, right? And very, very inspirational, uh, very much. So as you can see, Christopher is using this ability that he has that technological solutions are a way to fight disability. They're, they allow one to go further beyond what was ever imagined and arrive at a situation where from somebody who 10 or 15 years ago would have been stuck at home. He now runs his successful company, his own business. He's happy with his life. But how did this happen? Is it magic? No, it isn't. It's the fact that he can't use his hands, but he can use his eyes and he can use his head. So technology and accessibility features on your phone are also there, although you never knew they were there. So as you can see, many of the things in that we do in everyday life have been transformed already into 21st century elements. So artificial intelligence, CMS, LMS, and making it accessible allows these creative young people to create new solutions to problems that Right, like human beings have been having for centuries, but it's their creativity. Now, why do I link this with the first video? Might be a good, good question there. Because if you remember, it was said that when the child learns the two languages simultaneously, its creativity rises, right? And look at these young kids we have now because COVID pushed us all to the limit. Right? We have to stop doing things that we would do, we were doing normally, and we have to go online and try to do new things online. But what happened? It's the younger people, the younger generation, as we call them the digital natives, those who grow up simultaneously using a language. So let's call technology a language. So when we're talking about multilingual families, then this ability, this skill, or this secret language that we call technology is an extremely, extremely important element. And making use of that is what we have to deal with today. So what is a CMS? A CMS is a content management system. So in other words, it is most of the websites that you are visiting every day are CMSs. There's something that we're not written from the get-go, so not an HTTP, but they were basically, uh, it's almost like a, a ready piece of material that you go online and you use it and you build with it and it actually becomes something functional. And this is connected with uh, something that is called localization, which is the second phase of a larger process of product translation. And here, I'm not going, we're not using translation for linguistic terms, but more cultural adaptation. Therefore, bilinguals, multilinguals, and so in this case, if you're bilingual and you're literate in technology, you become a multilingual in a sense. So just carry, carry with my thought over here. And these are the people who are responsible for localization. And what that is, I'll, well, I'll tell you in a minute. But first, let me give you the example of 
again, in my branch, in translation, which is obviously working with languages. Now, for many years, translators were, used, were using traditional dictionaries, their own abilities, etc. But then over time, we had something which was then created and called machine translation. Machine translation at the very beginning was very slow. It, uh, it didn't work. You had those funny, fuzzy translations where you could make, uh, you can go laugh, uh, and they made no sense. But uh, they were initially created to support us. They were called CATs, or CATs in short, Computer Assisted Translation, which is based on corpus technology and translation memory. Translation memory meant that anytime you translate any group of phrases together, uh, it's automatically stored in the translation memory so that next time when you're translating something very similar, the computer just basically, the computer, the application gives you the solution, well, is this what you're looking for? And it cuts down the time uh, significantly. So there were the ones that were free out there and the most uh, practical one out there was WordFast, but, uh, and it was uh, WordFast anywhere, but the paid ones was SDL Trados and MemoCube, who are now actually beginning to use artificial intelligence technology. So the, ability, the, the, the quality of the translation, thanks to this technology, is remarkable. And in this sense, if we are a human being, a bilingual, who is then reading a translation done by a machine, by, an artif by artificial intelligence, it's our human intuition and our bilingualism that helps us correct where the machine went wrong. So at one point, it started to go faster than we had ever hoped. Why? Well, because machine translation went ANN, which means artificial neural networks. Now, before that, the internet and everything that we know was, um, was based on, on uh, statistical machine translation, so statistics, right? The statistical approach was finding within a large box of, of linguistic data uh, the statistical time when such a word would be translated this way or when statistically these two or three words coming together were used more, more frequently. But with the introduction of an algorithmic based AI, artificial neural network, we have actually broken the next barrier also in, 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 in technology, especially when it comes to uh, translation. So what is it? The algorithm emulates the human brain learning to parse words and the overall context of the sentence while comparing the similarity of individual words and phrases. Many of you might be scratching your heads and asking, what, what does that mean? Well, I'll try to explain. If you look at the way our cells and our neurons in our brains and our gray matter, which you have heard in the, the, the initial video, exist, the smart people actually invented to create this connection that we have in our brains, in our heads, that these connections resemble, uh, the, the ones that are in our heads will be resembled within the artificial intelligence. So just as we as young children are learning languages, we're becoming bilinguals or multilinguals, so is the AI, it's also learning. Deep machine learning, but again, it's remarkable. It can be used, but again, with the assistance of a human. So what it does is it has an input layer and an output layer. It limits these transmissions, but at the same time, it, it helps upgrade the possibilities, right? So for example, if a connection is finished between possibilities here and here and which connections can go, then naturally the ANN can create a new connection to see if other connections are possible. So it's just like us thinking, what will happen if I do this? Let me imagine. So this is happening, this is emulating exactly what's going on in, in our brains. So when people ask me, so is Google uh, an, an ANN, if we're talking about Google Translate, the famous, yes it is. It's an artificial neural network designed to emulate the human brain to learn speech, to learn languages, to become an artificial 
intelligence, as the name very well puts it. So if technology is all the way in front of us, how do we find ourselves or how do we cope with our reality? And how does that compose to, to teaching? Uh, and how can we use these tools to, to, to discuss things with our digital natives, our children, and by using these tools, foster, foster these elements? Because over COVID, we've got to accept it, we were locked up. Right, uh, A lot of the elements that you saw or that you heard of from the presenters at the conferences where these families would come together in the, in the lang language clubs, now we could only come together via the internet, via screen, by using this. And many people got uh, the feeling of isolation. But we're human beings. We will adapt. We just have to know how to do it. So this is why I am a very big supporter of focusing especially on education from the very early age of a child and we talked about these skills in the previous seminars where we talked about how we need to focus on the core subjects of the 21st century interdisciplinary themes so it's going away from a knowledge based approach in terms of remembering right because that's what most of us remember from school, there was material which we had to learn by heart and many young people are now asking the question, why? Why should I learn by heart? Uh, if I can just go on my smartphone and find out, why should I know these historical dates? To a certain extent, you have to know your history, of course, but I agree that it is more competence-based approach learning, right? Your skills-based or competency-based approach learning that outweighs a lot of the elements that have been present uh, in contemporary education. So just like here, having fun with languages, you, in order to speak a language, right, in order to, to, to acquire it, in order to, to, to be proficient in it, you need to use it. I always tell my son that when you're learning new words, don't try to, you know, learn and find the translation. Just try to make a sentence out of, in which you have uh, the meaning of the word and then put it in. I'll give you an example expeditiously an adjective do something expeditiously what does that mean well it means to be efficient and speedy so i would then use this in a context saying computer technology is making life expeditiously better than it was years ago so this 21st century skills approach uh, integrates the use of supportive technologies inquiry and problem-based approaches, and higher order thinking skills. So already as the added bonus, if you are a bilingual, if you are a multicultural person, if you are computer savvy or technology savvy, then your next step of education and developing has to be this problem skills approach, which will, as you see here, higher order thinking skills. And this type of education actually goes beyond the school. And it is a precursor to what we're basically having now uh, during COVID, right? That school finishes at a regular time, but digital learning goes outside the standard forms. Now, one of the solutions that was once proposed to this was, uh, of course, designed at Apple. And Apple uh, designed a learning methodology for the 21st century, which is called the challenge-based learning design. And the whole kind of, you know, the, the, the commercial slogan was everything starts with a big idea. So the big idea is finding a problem, right? Finding a problem and, and, and really discussing uh, a key issue that is important in our society. Then ask the essential question. Right, ask the essential question on what can be done in order to solve the problem or what can be done in order to realize the big idea. So, of course, we can start small. I want to be rich and happy. Okay, but the essential question is what will make you rich and what will make you happy? And then draw up the challenge. And on the basis of the challenge, get the 
guiding questions, the guiding activities, and of course the resources via the internet. So something completely new, right? When usually a teacher would say, turn off your, uh, turn off your phones, turn off your tablets, turn off your computers, open your books, a challenge-based learning design says, get out your, get your phone out because you're going to be searching for information. Then you find the solution, the assessment, and you publish samples. And that's quite great because it allows the people to interact, to have fun with the languages as the whole idea of a multilingual family club to sustain this cultural and multilingual heritage by using technology, right, is the essential element that can be used uh, as something helpful. Of course, you may find this similar because this is similar to the so-called PBL or the project-based learning approach, which as you can see here, uh, then driving question or challenge. What do you need to know? Then do the inquiry and investigation. Use 21st century skills. Student voice and choice. Get the feedback and go through revision and finally publicly present your product. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how I have used technology later on with my students and with my pupils at school. And concerning this PBL method, we, I had uh, a lesson called human anatomy, right? Which was supposed to teach kids the, the words that, uh, that the four, four organs in the body. So what we did, so what I did is I actually used the project-based approach because I thought if I'm going to tell them to learn this by heart and do a regular test, they're not gonna learn anything. They're not gonna have that, playing with languages and that using the language in order to become proficient and as a result bilingual multilingual so we developed this a, a, a problem the question was because summer was coming and i was asking students where are you going and they were saying all these different exotic countries oh i'm going to thailand i'm going to vietnam and that came to my idea okay but did you guys know that there you should take certain uh, health precautions first, you need to get some vaccinations for this, for that. They say, wait a minute, I didn't know that. And then another student shared a story in which uh, of the father's mm, mm, friend, meaning the student's father's friend, who was a truck driver, uh, was actually driving through with goods in Egypt during summertime. He was uh, in a truck with, with, of course, air conditioning. And he spent six hours behind the wheel sitting in air conditioning. And then when he came out into the massive temperature outside, the thermal shock caused him to collapse, right? So again, we say, wait a minute, do we take medical precautions before going to, let's say exotic places or different places for a vacation? So what we came up with is the students will be simulating a conversation between a patient and a doctor. And the doctor patient uh, uh, conversation will evolve around vaccinations and uh, ev everything that you need to know. So basically, they have to look through the words, find out, prepare a written conversation. They could only use these words, right? They couldn't translate them. So again, back to translation. Uh, and then they took their phones and they recorded it to make it to make a movie or a social commentary commercial and put it on Facebook right we got the word out we used technology they had fun they interacted and they learned and used the language in practice so it's not that technology is changing it's just uh, it's just evolution of our standard models, where normally in a book you would have an exercise and fill out the conversation with the words, why don't you get the kids to start doing that and start playing with languages? Because only by playing with languages and using that technology can you actually uh, move forward. This whole PBL is nothing new. It was invented by a man called John Dewey. He learned, he used the, the, the whole definition as we learn when we do something, right? And this is, again, nothing new. We can go all the way back to, to Socrates, who used to fool his students and tell them, 
certain things that were not true, but and then encourage you to find the truth because that is the only way that you learn. So the only way that you learn is by doing. The only way that you become true multilingual is by speaking. The only way that you can use technology or learn to grasp technology is by using it. This, John Dewey, this is the pedagogical creed from 1897. So it's nothing new. It's been here. It's just been misused and forgotten for a long time. The teacher is not in the school to impose certain ideas or to, serve or to form certain habits in the child, but it, he is there as a member of the community to select the influences which shall affect the child and to assist him in properly responding to these. I believe, therefore, in the so-called expressive or constructive activities as the center of correlation. So it's a very simple idea. The teacher is not there to impose. The teacher is there to guide. But if the teacher doesn't have the appropriate tools or doesn't speak the same language, meaning technology, then the teacher's time is wasted. The teacher's time is wasted because he or she will get extremely frustrated with the students. So try to speak their language, try to use the technology, and then start doing it right their way. That's why, uh, as you can see, studies uh, state that research has demonstrated that students in project-based learning classrooms get higher scores than students in traditional classrooms. So I'll give you another idea how to play with the language and how I worked with, uh, with my students. This, came, this is called Nauka Terminologi Lotniczej z PBL, which is learning term aviation technology with uh, project-based learning. I used CMSs. In other words, the fundamental background was, okay, learn the vocabulary, but learn it by doing and use technology to get there. Okay, so airplanes, aviation, flying, so many different elements there. So the sign, the, 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 whole, the whole project was imagine that we have a fictional airline, we call it Cobel or Cobair, uh, who comes to you and says, we're entering the market and we, need, we ask you to, uh, to give us a design of, uh, of our web page. The students would then look at me and say, wait a minute, but that's web design. We're not that, we're learning English. And I said, no, you can do this. You can do this. And I introduced them to how these, these artificial, so sorry, how these CMSs work. There are a bunch of them out there. You start from the most popular WordPress to one that I frequently like doing, like, like Jim do. And so my students would then use this in order to prepare their website. And again, they communicated only in English while doing so. And the end product, which I hopefully the internet will allow me in a moment, uh, I'll just leave the screen for a moment in order to, 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 to speed up the whole process and hopefully when uh when the when the website is on uh you could see how well uh these the, the the these elements have been done so it's opening now i'll just uh please be okay i can come back to you and share the screen so here we go Co bear aviation flying made easy so they simply used their skills in order to learn something about aviation, find words, and as you can see, we have a very nice background because they in, 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 in placed um, a, a, um, a video, a flight. It's getting longer, it takes longer to, 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 to uh, buffer you know, in this screening. Oh, but you can see it right now, right? And the whole point the students had was they wanted this computer screen with this screen, which you see right here, which is the computer co in the cockpit. So it was supposed to simulate flight, right? And give you the impression that uh, you are, you know, uh, steering your own airplane 
and elements such as, as you can see, wind direction and speed, runway conditions, uh, tow, thrust, flaps, stab trim, everything. Very complicated words, very complicated vocabulary, but now they know how planes fly. They can use the, this. And they found this extremely interesting as, 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 cre as the process of creation. So it was just using a simple tool and it was simply just using a simple tool and uh but the results were extremely uh well beyond my expectations uh at that point so coming back to so this is how you can use your own creativity and use the problem-based teaching approach and having people allowing them to have fun with learning if our I'll, I'll keep saying this because this was our project motto all the time have fun with languages let's play with languages and this is a modern way of playing with children that will now have already become bilingual by fostering and have grown and you'd be surprised at how many of them would actually will actually appreciate this here is another example. This is Praza Studentu San. So this is from my students. We took a very old website and well, we wanted to turn it into something modern. And again, translating it, translating it and by using all these new types of, of, of tools. And to give you other example, so to give you what that this, so this ladies and gentlemen has turned into, for example, this right and again creativity here pomorska bed and breakfast obviously this is was done in 30 minutes and this website well outdated so again that's another thing we find so this is a way in which you can use your everyday technology everyday the, the, the elements that you have access to on a day on a daily basis and you can throw that in and you can use it in order to improve your classes to improve um, your uh, your abilities in making the students wanting to actually learn languages and having fun with them so this is what technology has given us and this is why technology is an extremely important thing. But this is something from, again, coming back to how to now make use of your bilingualism. For example, as a translator, having access to artificial neural networks, knowing how they work, and seeing how this can all be achieved, we can go deeper to this process, which, uh, which is called localization. So the localization process is most generally related to cultural adaptation. Translation of software, video games, advertisement, and less frequently with any, with any written one, uh, although it does uh, involve the cultural element. You've probably never heard the term uh, what, what, trans what, what, what localization is, but because it actually comes from marketing. But because the entire world has become so digitized, because we have gone quite higher on the evolutionary ladder uh, connected with using technology and using that for our purposes, then localization is most generally related to cultural adaptation, right? Excuse me, that's a double slide, to cultural adaptation. And it is opposed to something which is called internationalization. So localization is making something fit the target locale. In other words, stripping of any international elements as internationalization is the process of generalizing a product so that it can be, can handle multiple languages and cultural conventions without the need for redesign. Internationalization takes place at the level of program design and document development. So for example, if we have a TV which uh, uh, operates on the American uh, market, Actually, the voltage is 110, but in Europe, it's 220. 
So obviously, from a technical point of view, if you want to internationalize that, you have to take out all the components that are 110 and put in 220, because if you leave 110, it's not going to work. Right? To give you examples of how this is done in video games and how people, how multilinguals, how multicultural people understand things. Um, many of you might remember a video game which is called The Settlers. The Settlers was basically, you know, building your own empire and you would click on your little pieces uh, uh, on your uh, moving around from one place to another and for example then you would click on a cow and the small settler would then approach the cow and it would change into a big steak. He would bring back food. You would click on another one, he would go, go build, go cut the woods, etc. So from a multicultural point of view, uh, not a translator, but a localizer will then say, hmm, wait a minute, that's not gonna work. For example, in Hindu culture. So if we're localizing the game in, or to India, for example, then we're obviously going to have to change the digital component of the cow into say a chicken or something else, which will again not involve the presence of a cow and it being slaughtered and eaten by the settlers. And that's intercultural competence. That's, that's what we already talked about. And once you get that, you will be capable of doing much more. So internationalization is not limited to software. Online help, documentation, and websites in particular also need to be internationalized. It is something that in, um, in the academic field, Lomel and Ray said that it's enabling a product at a technical level for localization. So the initial stage is to strip it of everything that might be specific to the culture from which it comes from. And then we have to reinsert these elements. That's why we have linguistic um, linguistic localization, for example, when we replace words that are not understood or would not be understood. This happens frequently in dubbing where we have to sync our lips, uh, where we have to have the dialogue with the lip sync and sometimes even changing that. So when we arrive at the process of localization, it involves taking a product and making it linguistically and culturally appropriate to the target locale, where basically, the whole element will be used and, and, and sold. So by definition, this is called the management of multilinguality across the global information flow, right? So multilinguals manage, manage these elements within digital products. So this involves everything from going from your smartphone uh, from going to your television set, to a video game, or many other things. So it's modifying a product, right? And it's your multilingual knowledge, which results in multicultural knowledge, which we've explained so much. And this is, for, and this is an example of where you can put that together. And so locale is defined as a set of parameters used to identify uh, the user's language and preferences. So just like with these websites, which you saw, before that I did with my students. Most of them had localization techniques to use there because we found elements that were either untranslatable or there were elements which uh, were completely uh, useless in, in, in it would be useless or misunderstood in the target culture and we had to take them out. So to give you another example of how this can work, as a very simple, when I worked at the University of Uch, I was once asked to do a language correction for, for their web page. And uh, I did. When I came to the section, which would be university uh, admission, I would say, okay, you see this element which says that your matura needs to be above or have certain percentage, you know, matura in Poland. People coming from abroad, they don't know what that is. Therefore, these applications, this is not important for their application, right? Because the page was just directly translated from the Polish version. It was completely not localized. In other words, it didn't take into account the international context of everything, right? So when the international context is out, then that's when we come to 
localizing a product. So people, students who come into our universities, they don't, in Poland, they, from abroad, they don't need their maturas. So obviously, and if you go through web pages, you'll see that many things are taken out. They're not the same in the original and they're not the same in the English, French or version because that's where people like me, the localizers, the multilingual people fascinated with technology and wanting to contribute to technology are behind the scenes working and making sure that everything uh, is, is up to specs. So what do these people do? What do multilingual, multicultural localizers do? Well, the workload is project management. It involves the translation and engineering of software. It um, uh, engineering and testing of online help and web documentation and content. Uh, DTP, so desktop publishing, translation and assembling of multimedia or even computer-based training components. Functionality testing of localized software or, or web applications. Right. So if you look at translation versus localization, there offer sometimes I've, I've seen this and it's been said that it's more it's a more high tech translation. But this view does not really encompass that. So we're just going to see the translation. So the language, so working with language is just one part of the localization process. So when throughout the series of webinars, when we've been asking the question, why I should be a, a bilingual or a multilingual, why is intercultural communication important? Well, here you have a physical digital example because we are the ones who make sure that the content that you see online, that you have in your phones, that you have, well, that you have in games, we're the ones who make sure that that element is properly assessed and given to you in, um, in the best way. So website translation and localization is another in interesting uh, aspect and it really involves coordination amongst many elements, right? Uh, Van Meer and Sandrini regard such a process as modifying the site in order to make it more accessible, uh, more usable, more culturally sustainable. And Juncker describes this as project oriented. So you see, this is why PBL is extremely important as a way of educating because the common workforce, the common uh, market is all based on problem solving issues, is all based on project based work. So if the first element which is required for your child is its multilinguality, its bilingual nature, that will create his or her uh, intercultural competence in nature. Getting used to these tools that are used now, meaning online tools. So we have two tools, right? We talked about language as a tool and now we have digital tools. So the two tools are used. Then you go through the project-based learning system to create this, uh, this um, high level thinking process uh, 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 moving forward and then that's your ease, easy or more accessible accessible access to the labor force right Christopher uses accessible technology to further himself we can use that technology to further ourselves but at the same time this accessible technology needs to be a part of the learning system, of the learning process, and it has to be interconnected with the child's openness. So it's multiculturalness and multilingual approach. So what, just to give you an idea of what happens in, uh, during this process. Well, the contents must be adapted to the linguistic and cultural system of the target language, obviously. The graphical components must also undergo any necessary transformations. To give you an example, uh, one of my students noticed that when localizing a website for uh, a hotel, he looked at, well, it wasn't a hotel like a three-star hotel, it was like a two-star hotel, a local hotel, and he found that most of the dominating color was black, and he felt this site feels a bit depressing. 
that background has got to change because again, that's another subconscious element. Now, in this sense, right, even that the graphical component, we're saying, oh, maybe this is too graphic for, um, for a European market, or maybe this is maybe inappropriate to show. That's all there. The page formatting must be taken into account, scripting components. So that's when, of course, some of the IT guys come in in order to do something, which again, in a diagram is called the global pyramid capstone. So you have various solutions when working within multicultural and multilingual within the digital frame. One thing can be controlled authoring. So in other words, we contact such a customer and then see if he can help us change his original content so that we can apply it, that it would be better understood by the target culture, right? Then we have the globalized pyramid capstone, which we internationalize. So we take everything away and then we localize. So decide, enable, and adapt. So it's all a process of adaptation or obviously finding some, uh, some process of optimizing the element. So, and marketing issues also need to be uh, taken into account. So in other words, the linguistic choice, and that's where your multilingualism comes into play. Uh, this is the place where you as a native speaker of one or two or three languages, will understand what's going to sound good in one language and what isn't. And as opposed to a regular translator, so as somebody who has learned a language, as opposed to acquired the language and its culture, then basically you're going to have that ability where you can fix and make it sound good, right? So I always tell my students, don't, uh, don't translate it, make it sound English, make it sound native. So that when I read it, I don't see automatically that this is a translation. So text must be adapted to domestic marketing strategies. What works in this culture and what won't work in this culture. Text must be adapted to domestic communication standards, etc. So this would allow us to change the product in order to achieve uh, the required effect. So as you can see, technology and multilingualism and multiculturalism can go in different forms. We already know that people who are bilingual understand more, are capable of thinking on different levels. If we add to these successful tools, uh, the, the, these successful skills, the ability to use contemporary uh, digital tools, then we're not only again, investing in our child's future, but we're giving them a smoother ride through the ever-changing reality. Now, I know that many people may be opposed, but uh, I frequently believe that this is the next step, that this is the natural way in where we go after we have mastered uh, the multilingual ability and thus multicultural. So get technology as much into your life and use it as an ability in order to uh, prep anyone to be, uh, to be ready to, to, to face the world. Don't be afraid of it. COVID has already shown us that we're going to have to use this far more often than, than we can. And with examples such as Christopher, because I love giving the example of Christopher, uh, he uses this to his advantage. And in this sense, uh, we all can too. So that will end uh, this section of uh, the presentation. In the next uh, short section, I will be focusing on questions and answers, where uh, I'll try to answer, uh, uh, well, try to answer the most important questions now for both the COVID situation, as well as, again, more using multicultural tools, sorry, uh, digital tools in multicultural situations and having fun with languages. So thank you for this one. I hope to see you in the next.